put by Mr Fairley. Thanks, Provost. Um, this is the first in a series of financial reports which sets out the financial por performance of the Council for the year ended 31st of March 2015. I will cover the financial performance as I present items 22 through 25. Uh, but in terms of the financial statements, uh, this report, um, the, the statements for the year, um, th there are no really significant or major changes um, in terms of the layout of the account, um, in terms of the, the account requirements of the, the accounting code of practice. Um, one, one change, however, I draw your attention to uh, was the introduction in the year of a, a management commentary. Um, and if you do nothing else, I would encourage officers and, and members to, to read that part of the document. Uh, I appreciate that the rest of the financial statements are somewhat technical in nature. So definitely would encourage you to, to read through that. It provides a, an overview of the Council's financial position and the, the activity through the year and, and the challenges and the risks that the Council face. Um, in terms of the accounts themselves, these will now be made available for public inspection. Um, and the financial statements audit undertaken by Grant Thornton uh, is already underway and will be reported through audit committee uh, and a set of audited accounts um, come to council in, in the autumn. Um, today it's really just recommended that council endorse the report and approve the financial statements for 2014-15. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bryant. Thank you, Provost. Yeah, I would like to endorse what Guy said and, and ask members to read this um, financial report and in particular <coughs> if you look at page 5 where it shows you the, um, the underspend and where there's, there's areas that save money um, almost uh, £5 million pounds, which is to be uh, lauded. I'm happy to accept the recommendations. Can I slide back to Thank you, Prof. It's just a, a question, really. It, it didn't occur to me. Somebody actually asked me, and I thought I wasn't quite sure what the implications were. But when we're building new houses, as we were talking about before in Midlothian, we obviously get more council tax, but council tax is only uh, about 20% of our income. Much of the rest comes from Scottish Government grant. So if we have a higher population in Midlothian, is the Scottish Government grant, does that increase? What are the implications of new house building, is, is essentially my question. Yeah, there are a number of, um, there's a grant distribution basis which takes the, the overall sum that Scottish Government determine it will give to local government and divides it up 32 ways. Um, a number of the indicators that are used in the distribution model are population based, uh, whether pure head count, um, number of houses, number of children, number of people over a certain age, etc. Um, so that works through the, the mechanics of the grant distribution formula. Um, and yes, it does result in, in an increase. Um, there is, however, a, a, an arrangement where there are, are limits put on growth in any one year so that you don't have um, very big swings between one authority and another. Um, that tends to impact negatively on Midlothian so that councils that are declining in size have got some relative protection, uh, and that's funded by councils like our own who are, who are at the growth end of the spectrum. But yeah, we do get more money through the grant system for growth. Okay. Thank you. Item number 22, financial monitoring, 2014-15, general fund revenue, report by Mr Fairley. Thanks again, Provost. Uh, this report sets out the performance uh, against budget uh, for 14-15 on, on the, the main account, the general fund revenue account. This is detailed in Appendix 1 and 2. Uh, there was an underspend of the year of approximately £4.7 million. Um, that's a material improvement from the position that was reported to Council at quarter three in February. Um, and Section 2.2 of the report sets out the principal um, matters that have given rise to that variation. Um, we are currently undertaking a review to ascertain the impact of, of the, the performance for 14-15 both in the current year's financial year's budget and also the implications for future year's budgets. Uh, and then when that work's completed, it will be reflected in the, the quarter one financial monitoring report for 15-16 that will come forward to Council in September, uh, along with uh, the implications feeding through into the financial strategy report that will come to the same Council meeting. Uh, section 2.4 of the report sets out uh, 
for members the position on reserves. Uh, the balance on the general fund reserve um, in accordance with the unaudited accounts is £21.3 million, of which approximately £8.5 million is earmarked for specific purposes. That leaves a general reserve which exceeds what we previously determined as a prudent level, but it does, however, provide a buffer against service pressures, uh, savings targets um, and one-off costs associated, associated with change programmes. Um, and in light of the sort of financial environment that we are, we're likely to face over the coming years, I think having a, a healthy reserves position is, 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 is a sensible approach. I'm happy to pause at this point. Um, if there's any questions in terms of the detail in the appendix in particular, um, any questions you may have for me or, or colleagues. Um, otherwise, Council is requested to consider the recommendations as set out in Section 4 of the report. Thank you. Councillor Bryant. Thank you, Provost. Uh, firstly, Gary, I would like to thank the officers in the Finance Department for all the hard work in completing these financial statements in, in the allotted time of burning the midnight oil, as I call it. I also welcome the positive strategy and strong financial stewardship and I welcome your review of the 14-15 and, and how this will impact on future years' budgets where we have got problems coming down the line. I submit that the Chamber accept the healthy position the Council is in and share my hopes for the future. I would temper this by saying that the Tory budget coming next month will surely bring some pain with certain cuts coming. I would also like to highlight Appendix 2, page 201, under Adult Social Care, where there is an overspend due to sickness absence and I understand this is being addressed. Present comments. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, yes, Mr. Mulligan. Yeah, th thanks, Provost. Provost, I have two or three questions. Uh, um, on page 204, under homeless accommodation, uh, um, that paragraph just seems to end uh, um, inexplicably duty phase two of the new social housing programme. Is there, is there something missing for the end of that? <coughs> Should it perhaps read duty been behind time or <laughs> delay in the, the, the programme. There just seems to be some word they're missing there. Um, Provost, that, um, th that variation was primarily in relation to the turnover and the new bar situation and the availability of housing as a consequence of that. Okay. I still know. Share, but, 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 I, I still feel there's something missing for the end of that, that sense. However, um, it is quite perturbing to see that we have um, 88 people in bed and breakfast in this day and age, and you would hope that we would be moving to be, be, be doing something um, about that as soon as we, we, we can. Can I take you to the Vogue Country Park income on page um, 206? And parking income is not expected to achieve the income target. By ten thousand pounds. That's ten thousand cars. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm at a loss to see how there would be a drop in that kind of visitor numbers uh, um, to Vogue uh, um, Estate. I'm at an absolute loss. Or, or am I misreading this? There's perhaps two um, comments I would make to that. The first is that. Um, the projected income for uh, Vogri was perhaps over-optimistic, so rather than a drop in numbers, we've just now um, achieved the increase that we perhaps hoped. The second thing is in terms of the, the barrier, we've had historic problems uh, with the barrier and there have been uh, significant periods where it's not been available. We are addressing that now um, and we hope to um, install a new barrier. Um, so going forward into next year, we would hope to... Um, <coughs> address that problem and that gap would certainly be significantly closed. Ricky, on that, could you maybe tell us what, what, what the difference in figures are for last year to, uh, um, for this year to, 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 to the year before? Um, because I find it strange that we would suddenly put up 
an estimate that we were going to get a, an additional 10,000 uh, um, cars turning up at, at Vogra without having some for some reason. It just seems to be a big drop. If you didn't have that figure there, if you could maybe perhaps uh, fire me what the, the year bef beforehand figures are. Yeah, I'll provide those figures for you. Okay. Uh, on page 207, uh, um, the bottom area there, where we're talking about several postage uh, and IT supplies, um, we seem to have changed supplier uh, um, and secured better prices, but yet we're still £64,000 over, uh, over budget. And it's the same with the, the cost of printer um, consumables exceeding budget. We were told we're bringing in that new system that we would um, save save money. Uh, and instead of that, in quarter four, the, the, the targets went, went up the way rather than doing the way. Uh, and that's with the new system in, in place. Is there anybody able to sort of tell us how that can be? Yeah, in terms of um, dealing with the, the, the printer and IT supplies, We've had a historic budget pressure there uh, where the, the, the cost of supplies has exceeded the, the budget for a, for a number of years. Uh, that perhaps hasn't been um, absolutely apparent in previous financial monitoring reports. Um, we are still in the process of rolling out the multifunction devices. You've seen them within Midlothian House, I'm sure, uh, but we're still in the process of rolling those out. So we should see the full rollout of that that project um, start to be allow us to, to um, re recover some of that overspend um, in, in next financial year. In terms of postage, um, the Council has again for some time had a, a pressure on that budget. Um, we're working as part of the Integrated Service Support Review to look at how we can take postage out of the system, how we can use email and, and all as part of the move away from a, a, a um, a paper-based organisation to a, a, a paperless environment and, and members have already contributed to, to one small part of that in terms of the, the proposals for a new committee management system. So we've got a number of initiatives there which are to avoid us having to send paper out the door at, at high cost through, through the, the Royal Mail and other postage systems. Uh, but it continues to be a challenge to just um, man manage that, that financial pressure. Professor, the last issue that I have to raise is on 211, and it probably brings us back to the, the procurement and, and transformation through procurement savings. We have a target in there of £705,000, and, and it seems that we've, we've actually got 107000 yet, so, so effectively uh, um, £598,000 hasn't been realised. Is that now the second year in the trot that we've actually failed to realise these, the, the, these savings? And one of the ones that sticks out a mile for me, I'm sorry to say, is again transformation savings and maximising attendance £155,000. We've not saved one penny. Not, not, not one penny a, 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 the budget was saved in there. I, I mean, where do we get confidence that, that these targets are, are achievable when there's such a low a, a, a gain for them at all. It, it's quite disappointing to see targets say, a £705,000 to be saved, uh, and yet uh, there's only £107,000, and, and in the maximising attendance, there, there doesn't seem to have been a penny saved at all. I'm happy to, to respond in terms of the, the, the procurement savings. When we brought the financial strategy forward um, back um, in December through February, um, we looked carefully at the procurement savings and we've realigned the savings over the period of the, the transformation programme. And it really touches, I suppose, on the point I was making, making earlier. We're now in third generations of tendering contracts and it is extremely challenging to get budget savings out of these. What we are able to do is, is to avoid additional costs or to actually constrain the, the inflationary pressures that come through some of the contracts. But it's proved extremely challenging to take take real budgetary savings out of that, that, that process. Um, and we'll continue to look at making sure that we've got robust figures through the contract delivery plan um, that are achievable and highlight whether it's savings to stand still or whether it can actually reduce the, 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 the budget. Uh, in terms of maximising attendance, we set the, the targets there, what, what's proved to be challenging through the year has been to actually harvest that, that, 
that overall saving from individual services budgets. But I've no doubt that some of the, the underspends that we've seen within services relates to the work that has been going on behind the scenes to, to improve the, 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 the application of our absence management policies. Um, it, it's mainly the, the harvesting of that and being able to take the money out of service budgets that's, that's proved, proved more challenging. Uh, but happy to come back in terms of specific details around where we've seen improvements um, within, within absence management within services. Councillor Pottinger. In adult social care, uh, on page 201, uh, the residential homes for older people have still got a, uh, a large uh, overspend uh, on, on the budget. My question would be why does this continue after we've had so much review uh, and so much time to, to, to address the issues that has been well raised uh, previously in this chamber um, about this uh, overspend when it was even in quarter two at uh, over the, the half a million amount. And uh, we will never be able to, and, and I'm right in presuming that we'll never be able to return to the zero kind of budget level that, that was in that uh, situation and that the review line uh, is going to indicate, or the full reports are going to indicate, that uh, the baseline will, will, will uh, change. And I'm just wondering how much this baseline will actually change with, within uh, that remit, uh, and if I could be in, informed a bit more uh, of that decision, um, and keep informed on the, on the, on the process. Uh, turning over onto uh, page uh, 202 on the uh, gross... Uh, Overspend. I see the Community Care Resource Panel uh, has uh, got uh, a, a major uh, uh, um, uh, underspend of 439,000. Now, I know this is uh, very much client-led uh, or demand-led with individual packages, uh, and sometimes these care packages can cost up to 100,000 at a time. But is, is it possible then to, to readdress the, the baseline? On, on this, uh, or, is it, uh, or is this just a blip uh, for this uh, financial report um, that uh, it's, uh, it's not had such high demands on, on the costs or, or, or any other information you could give on that? And finally, on client income on uh, page uh, 203, um, towards the bottom of the, of the chart there, contributions from clients towards their care packages are higher than anticipated. Can I, can I ask for a breakdown uh, of that? Um, because, again, it's, it shows a significant difference in a figure. And I'm just wondering how many persons are involved uh, in this. Uh, so it's a numbers thing, not just a, a money thing. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'll be able to look at see what was possibly new charges and what was existing charges, um, or, or maybe even uh, if it's been more effective charging, you know, uh, with less, you should always say, arrears and debts and stuff like that, so I can have more information on the, on the client income uh, charges. Thanks. Uh, Provost, um, the first one is in relation to the costings in residential homes for older people. Um, the costings has, ha, has been reduced and there has been some reductions in sickness absence. However, um, as I've stated previously in the Chamber, it is a longer term project and there are, um, there's considerable work underway. We've done a piece of work around understanding the contributory factors. We're addressing those in terms of um, the work that's going on within the unit, in terms of staff engagement, um, the, the, the day to day management of staff, etc. And we're seeing some changes to that. But there's further work that we need to do in terms of the demands that are made of staff. Um, the other uh, costs that are included in that isn't just sickness absence, there's also costs in there that are to do with the higher dependency levels. We've, um, in one home, we've increased staffing, nighttime staffing above, um, uh, temporarily above our establishment in order to respond to individual residents' needs. So there are some variations in there. What we are doing at the moment is looking, reviewing our staffing structure, our management structure, to make sure that it's fit for purpose because the reality is the way we're using residential care now is very different from how it was even three years ago. Uh, the length of stay is much shorter, we're doing much more palliative care and it's much more intensive support. But 
There is also, um, as you rightly pointed out, there is an issue to do with sickness absence being above a level that is acceptable. The other issue that you raised was in relation to um, the, the resource panel. Um, there are a number of factors that are outlined there in relation to the change in projections. Um, at quarter two, quarter three, we were projecting an overspend there. There was a series of actions that were taken by managers around the rigour of the decision-making processes. There's also an inherent variability in the panel in that we could, can have at one point in, in time, as you rightly say, a number of packages that are very expensive where you've, we've seen um, a rise in people's needs and we've responded to that and we, we will then project forward for that for the whole year. But in reality, often what happens is as we get the right support in, that the cost of those packages may then be reduced, and, and that has happened. This year, um, again, linked to um, the introduction of uh, self-directed support, there's been a lot of change, and two of um, areas of spend, our projections were actually higher in terms of the commitments that, um, than actually what had transpired, and that was really to do with the shift from previous funding to um, the self introduction of self-directed support and some of the projections that were built into the budget around that. Um, I'm sorry, the third... Outline charging. I'd be very happy to provide more information on that. Um, part, part of the one of the things that we've been working on is providing inform, uh, better information to clients at a much earlier stage around the implicate. You know what charging is likely to be, and making sure that our systems are better in terms of providing people with better information, and that's resulted in, in some improvements in terms of collection. But very ha we'll be very happy to provide a more detailed breakdown around the profile of um, income from charging. Councillor okay, Pottinger. Yes, and if you also could comment on any changes to the baseline budgets, because um, they, they too have already mentioned, uh, and I know overall, or I suspect overall, it's not going to make any effect to the social work department budget, but I'm interested in any changes to those two items in, in baseline budget. So I'm happy to feed back. Um, I don't have the details with me, but happy to feed back as part of the, the response. Thank you. Okay. All right, we move on to item... 23, General Services Capital Plan, 2014-15, final outcome report by Mr Fairley. So the Provost, this report sets out the final outcome, as you say, on the General Services Capital Plan. Um, key points I draw to members' attention. Um, investment in your asset base for the year was, was just over £11.5 million. Um, there's a further commitment of £4.7 million of investment which is carried forward and being spent in the current financial year. Um, we've seen a, a, a small underspend on the final cost of providing the new Burnbury Primary School, which has been delivered within, within budget. And we've, to, to fund that investment, we've secured funding through Scottish Government grant, etc., of, of nearly £10 million. Um, with, with £4.2 million pounds of capital receipts transferred into the capital fund. Um, as a consequence, the, the, the investment, uh, the borrowing for the year to, to support that investment was just over £1.4 million, pounds, uh, which re results in a, a, an overall net reduction in our, our debt, um, which still remains within the overall cap. Um, there's a paper later in the agenda in terms of the implications of ESA 10, uh, and as a consequence of that, through this report, we're asking uh, members to, to um, reinstate the, the, the overall debt cap in terms of Council's general fund assets at £114 million. Pounds. So again, today, I ask Council to, to consider the recommendations set out in Section 4 of the report. Thank you. Councillor Bryant. Thank you, Provost. I'm happy to accept the recommendations, Gary, and uh, happy about the continued investment in our asset base as well. Thank you. Questions, comments? Okay, thank you.
Item number 24, the Housing Revenue Account, Revenue and Capital Final Outturn 2014-15 and the Capital Plan 2015-16-2017-18. I'll report by Mr Fairley. Thanks, Provost. And so turning to the Housing Revenue Account, key points to note. Um, the, the account saw, as, as expected, a small underspend of the year, just about £350,000. My apologies. Um, a reserve at the year end of £21.5. £377 million, pounds, and as I've touched on in earlier discussions, the majority of that required to fund the, your existing investment plans um, in either new build or in the existing asset base. Um, Council invested in its housing stock um, £11.88 million pounds in the year, um, and today really I'm just asking Council to note the report. Councillor Brent. Thank you, Provost. I welcome the report, which is uh, broadly on budget as we continue to carry on investing in our housing stock, which was started by our Labour colleagues here on the left. Um, we are now reaping the benefits with a major reduction in our maintenance bill. So we're happy to expect, uh, accept the report. OK, happy to accept that. Thank you. Item number 25, the Annual Treasury Management Report 2014-15. Final report by... Mr. Fairley. Like you say, Provost, the final report um, from, from me at this stage in terms of the financial position. Um, this just sets out our Treasury activity for 14-15. Uh, main points to note are set out in Section 2 of the report um, uh, with a detailed Treasury management report uh, attached as the appendix. Um, treasury activity really ensures the effective financing of the investment decisions that Council's made. Um, Buried within the depths of the, the accounts, um, um, are, are, we disclose that the value of our asset base, and it's some half a billion pounds uh, of assets, um, and we have borrowing of around 235 million pounds to, 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 to fund that. Um, our treasury activities undertaken in accordance with the, the approved treasury management policies that have been approved by Council. And, and the borrowing in the year is determined by the, the capital plans that, that council, council approved. So again, today, Provost, just asking you to note the Treasury Management Annual Report for 14-15. Councillor Bryant. Thanks, Provost. Um, happy to note the report, Gary. OK. Number 26 is not the seminar at the Cabinet held on the 26th of May. Okay. Councillor Bennett. Yeah, just, uh, I, I didn't make the seminar myself because of a, a pre-engagement, but as, rega as regards uh, the parking in Dalkeith, uh, the, there's been reports by the, and the Dalkeith advertiser with the Colin, Colin beat the MSP complaining about parking on double yellow lines. But really, the situation in Dalkeith is that the car parks, which were introduced two or three years ago, I can't remember the exact date, the shoppers' car parks, which are free for an hour, and if you want another two years, it's a pound, they're not getting used. People just aren't using them, and it was working fine. And the problem is that Police Scotland withdrew the traffic wardens out of Dalkeith Town Centre, and people are just parking on double yellow lines, and there's no action taken against them. So the problem is that the parking facilities in Dalkey, the problem is that it's not being placed and, it's, and there's no traffic wardens available. There's supposed to be one traffic warden for the Hale of Midlothian. I, I, I don't know, I've never seen a traffic warden. I've never seen a traffic warden. And it's really, if you take the, the top of Dickies Bray, the junction there, the parking right across outside the, the, the chip shop and big lorries kind of get turned and there's nobody doing nothing about it. They're, just, they're all double yellow lines. Then the matter, I see that the report says we could have made double yellow lines. Some of the comments we said they are blitz on uh, illegal parking in Dalkeith. I can't speak for other areas because uh, I, I don't know what the situation is there. But certainly, I travel for down the road and so does a lot of people to Dalkeith to go to the butchers or go, whatever, to go to the shops. No problem parking whatsoever if you use the par par car parts that's provided. Councillor Rosie. Yeah, um, <coughs> I've got to say, I 
But I agree with, with Alec on the situation. Now I raise it in, pe in the Penny Cook situation is, is similar. And I know that I went to get the bus the other day to go up to, to Bonnevig and there's two cars on the bus stop and the buses are queued up at the back. So, and that's in Dalkeith. Um, I, I have certainly, and Ricky will tell you, I've nipped away about the Penny Cook situation because folk can't get near put folk are parking in the high street all day. And I have raised issues about that, and I believe my, my last email has been passed on to the, the police, um, my comments on it and, and what should happen. And I, I think you're right, we're putting money into it. Um, therefore, we, should we get some, something back on that? And uh, even if it was, I, I reckon the Pennycoop one that I can speak on, it would be probably, even if he came once a fortnight, to be honest, and he did the blitz, word got round, then folk would stop parking in these places they would get round. Um, but uh, at the moment, it seems that they're getting moved about and used by the police for, uh, for other areas. But, but yeah, I, I've got to agree. Councillor Limley. Yeah. Thanks, Provost. I mean, I think we've got to go back to where it all started from, whether that was with the creation of Police Scotland. And let, no, let's, let's just, just let's start down, down the road of where we got to. And, Supported, may I hasten to add, by the, uh, the parties around this table at Scottish Government level. And uh, the introduction of Police Scotland brought with it all the fears that were certainly uh, discussed and debated in this chamber. And it's come to light, hasn't it? I mean, at least with the old system of the regional boards uh, of Lothian and Borders Police, this wasn't even on the agenda. And all of a sudden... Police Scotland decided, when they started looking at budgets, that we were told would be neutral. All of a sudden, Police Scotland look at the budget and say, "Ah, where can we make, where can we, where can we save money?" Not with, not taking into account that where they save money, it was going to fall onto the 32 local authorities uh, to actually find that money in order to create a system. We had a situation, for example, where to set up a, a, a proper uh, parking regime with traffic, with traffic wardens, you actually have to decriminalise that. That takes something like over two years to set up. Now, COSLA, on behalf of all the 32 local authorities, went back and asked for a delay to be put in place. That wasn't successful, and this council actually put money in uh, along uh, with Police Scotland to get an extension of a traffic warden in this area for a year in order to, to try and find a common solution. The difficulty was at that time, although my understanding is that has changed, Transport Scotland were saying quite clearly that if the system that you want to put in place does not either make a profit or is cost neutral, then they won't sign it off. In other words, local authorities can't take that on. The difficulty, and they've changed their position on that, is they're like, make every effort to get there, <coughs> which is not great. The difficulty I've got, Provis, with this whole, whole report is that it's a seminar report. And as we all know, seminars don't make recommendations. And I haven't heard anything from the administration about a way forward. Now, funnily enough, we discussed this in a paper at the CESTAN board on, on Friday, and I'll tell you, right round the table, those authorities that don't have decriminalised parking, because Edinburgh does and Fife does, those authorities that don't have that, they have the same mayhem in their, in their towns and villages as we have. Now, the other side of that is that the police in this area haven't actually done anything about moving people on. There are people on W lines, there are people at bus stops, there's people parking on corners. And I'd like to know the numbers. I don't know, Ricky, if you have that uh, uh, right now. If you don't, then get it appended to the, to the minutes uh, so that we can all see that. How many vehicles have been moved on by the police since the, the, the withdrawal of the traffic warden service throughout Scotland? How many within the middle of the area have been moved on? Because you just need to go out this front door and walk along the road there. Double yellow lines right along there. Parked there every day, vehicles, and nobody doing a thing about it. 
you go round the corner there and you see them there. Now, we were terribly hard provost. The Alkeith Business Renewal came to us and said, listen, in order to sustain shops in Dalkeith, can you come up with a system that would help? And as Councillor Bennett's already stated, we came up with that system after a lot of agonising in this council chamber, a system that was endorsed and it was actually working. And there were people actually parking in the car parks, using it because you get free parking if you're, if you're quick. Well, you get the first hour free, and I think it's what is it, 50 pence or a pound for the, for the next couple of hours. So you get three hours, you could argue, for a pound if you need that time. There's not a car in these car parks nowadays. You just need to go around and, and have a look at that because they're all parking all over the place. That's not helping businesses. That's not helping. And, and what it's doing is it's spreading. It's spreading out with the centre of Dalkeith into residential areas in, this, in, the, in the surrounding part of Dalkeith as well. And I just think, Rob, is we need to get something done about it. The difficulty we have is we don't have a recommendation and we don't have a paper, actually, to do anything about it. And I don't know if it's appropriate to actually move a course of action that we ask the officers to, to bring back a paper uh, at, by the next council meeting with recommendations to find a way forward. Now, I know that's not going to be easy because you've got, it takes time to put something together. But... Elected members are getting it in the neck all the time, and I'm sure the officers are getting phone calls into their, their, their department about the difficulties around Midlothian. We all, we all know it, we all see it uh, in our daily lives, and I just really think something's going to happen. We can't go back to what we had because we ain't got the resources to do it. So we're going to have to find a common way forward, and it may be that the Edinburgh the, the Edinburgh uh, system that's sitting there at the moment may be the opportunity to go the right way, but that's going to take a little bit of time. And meanwhile, I, you know, I'd like to see what, what the local police force in this area are doing about the number of abandoned, and I'll call them abandoned cars. They're only abandoned for the day because people then come and pick them up and take them away uh, uh, to get on with their daily lives. But I really do think it's come to a, a critical situation where we need to do Something about it, Provost. Oh, yeah. yeah, Provost, I, I'm, I is really concerned, and I think I 100 percent agree with the fact that Russell's saying here is, is that the police just seem to have abandoned us. If we hadn't actually given them the money to bring in a, a traffic ward, then uh, um, we would have absolutely nothing. But you've got to keep in mind that traffic ward has been pulled away to the, the, the schools and areas like that. To, to, to try and uh, deter uh, um, discriminate parking in, in, in areas, and Midlothian has got a big wide range to go for one guy to, to cover. But it is clear that the police just seem to have abandoned this completely. You every day see people parked in bus stops, parked on pavements, parked in double yellow lines, and police cars passing them willy nilly and nothing happening. Uh, um, the police's argument that, that if it's causing an obstruction or that, they'll, mm. they'll do something about it. They've still to tell us how many folk they've actually ticketed for, for causing an, an obstruction. And I think we, we, we do need something uh, and done. The problem for me here is, is for the report for the seminar and for the information for the seminar, unless Ricky corrects me and I'm willing to be corrected, um, it looks like the only affordable way for us to deal with this is to go around uh, and bring in privatisation of a, 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 a parking laws and bring in an Edinburgh, or else that we're faced with hundreds of thousands, if not £200,000 bills to try and bring in, to, to decriminalise parking or, or, or sell. Mm. I don't particularly want to see parking wardens that, that are working for the private sector out here. I would rather see uh, um, traffic wardens who are clearly no seen as being there for, for, for financial gain. I don't think it'll do this council any good whatsoever in the eyes of the public out there, but something has to give. We can't continue doing the line we are. When you're watching people with buggies, disabled people that can't get on buses because somebody decides just to dump their car at the bus stop to walk 50 feet to a, to, to, to a shop and folks left struggling to get on and off of buses. Um, I genuinely think we need to get something back reasonably quick because this isn't going to be a, a quick fix. And maybe Ricky 
can outline the, the time scale to go down the line, but correct me if I'm wrong, Ricky, I know there are other options there, but certainly for me, for the seminar, for the paper that's here, it looks like the most favoured option <coughs> is to adopt the Edinburgh approach, which will mean uh, um, private parking wardens out in Midlothian, something I would have hoped never to have seen. Yeah, there's two things that um, I'll comment on. The first is a comment that Councillor Emily's made, or a question, sorry, and it follows on actually from a question that Councillor Mulligan asked me um, back at the seminar, and that was the number of times that uh, vehicles have been ticketed within Midlothian. And I have asked that question of Police Scotland, um, and I have had an apology from the inspector um, that he's not came back, but he will provide that information, and as soon as I've got it, I will forward it. The, the second question in terms of um, options and a report, more than happy to bring forward a report to um, the next council meeting in August. Um, in terms of the time frame from the start of a process to actually having uh, some form of parking enforcement in place, Councillor uh, Emery is absolutely right. Historically, for authorities of similar sizes, that process takes uh, about two years. Um, at a seminar uh, I was at with Transport Scotland, um, there was a suggestion that that perhaps could be um, brought down to 18 months with a fair wind. So it's between 18 months and two years from the start to you actually see enforcement in place. I'd like to ask what our uh, wonderful Community Safety Board have actually done about this in terms of their relationship with the police at a local level, what kind of questions have been asked? Have the sort of questions that we've asked here today been asked by the Community Safety Board or the police at a local level? Have they asked them how many uh, tickets they've issued? Have they asked them what action they've taken against obstructive vehicles? And if so, what was the reply? No, the questions haven't been asked to the, the, the Community Safety Board. So, okay, happy to get a report, but Councillor Johnson. Maybe that's why you should come along, Jim, and find out. You can contribute and ask these questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking what you know, the, that's the, the role of the Community Safety uh, Board, as, as, you, as you've defined it, should be to, to quiz the police at a local level and look at issues like that. Yet it's not happening, and I think the reason it's not happening is because you know what the answer would be. It's good now to day with us at the end of the day. Police Scotland have taken that decision, and that's why we're knowing it, because it has no influence whatsoever. OK, that was a, a seminar uh, Not anyway, so we'll move on from there. Item number 27, Midlothian Council Grants Transition Fund, a report by Evelyn McHugh. Provost, this report provides information that was requested um, by Council on the decision-making process in relation to the allocation of grants under the Transition uh, Fund, which was set up as part of the Council Grants Review. Section 2 sets out the background to the Transition Fund and also sets out the criteria for deciding on grants allocation. Section 3 and 4 pro provide clarity on the two items that members um, sought information on. The first in uh, Section 3 was in relation to two um, applicants where the, there wasn't a big differential in the scoring and m m members wanted a clearer understanding on the differential between the two projects and, and the decision-making process. The, um, just for clarity, the unsuccessful... Um, application. It was not rec recommended for funding because the organisation did have continuing funding beyond the period that the transition grant was set up for. Um, in fact, it had fund has funding right through till the end of 2015 and it also had significant contracts with the council for the delivery of a range of service, thus the risk around uh, redundancy for staff was not as immediate or as um, great as, as, as the other organisation. And the second area that members sought clarity on was in relation to the increase in the fund. 
uh, the original fund, 32,000 was set aside, but that was increased by 46,000 from other budgets. And it was just to clarify that this was done under the financial directors, directors of the council, which allows council officials to direct money from one operational uh, budget head to another, but under, but only following the approval of the head of finance and integrated service support, and that uh, was the process in in, in this situation. Um, members are asked to consider the recommendation in section six. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Um, this report does provide me with assurance on the two concerns raised at the March Council. One was the scoring process of the transition grant, and that's now been clearly explained in terms of the decision process concerning the two lowest scoring organisations. The timing of the end of the current grant was not until December this year, and furthermore, the organisation already received substantial funding from the Council for its valuable work carried out in their communities. It's also been clarified here that the underspends from Fairer Scotland Fund used to increase the transition fund was appropriately authorised. Uh, and it was all explained to Owen when he was here. Thank you very much. OK, happy with that report. Thank you. Twenty-seven. A Regeneration Capital Grants Fund, a report by Mary Smith. Thank you, Provost. Um, this report um, informs the Council of an opportunity to bid for funding from the Scottish Government Regeneration Capital Fund. Um, it proposes to give priority to seeking grant funding to support capital investment in an arts theatre complex in the Newton Grange area. The RCGF has been developed in partnership with COSLA and local authorities as an annual budget of £25 million to provide financial support to projects that will help deliver large-scale improvements in deprived areas. The Council was asked to note that we were advised of the bidding on the 2nd of June and the deadline for the bid is the 10th of July. The RCGF's criteria are set out in summary below. Um, because of the very short time scale, uh, we had previously um, developed an outline proposal for an arts theatre complex in Newton Grange on a site in close proximity to the National Mining Museum. And um, it involved a short life cross divisional group which met with Creative Scotland. This bid was subsequently unsuccessful. So, given the short time frame, we've re looked at that bid again in order to, to gain some money, but also it would bring in uh, funding. Up possibility of other funding um, from Borders Rail, um, Tyne-esque leader funding and the possibility of City Deal. So we're looking to maximise that. Um, the outline business case is set out in 3.1. Um, the risks are we've got very short time to do this piece of work. We had done um, previous consultation regarding this uh, and the risks are set out at 3.2. Um, and uh, in the recommendations, the Council is recommended to approve the submission for funding um, and, as far as possible, in relation to top short time frame, engage further with the National Mining Museum and local arts community and instruct the Director of Education and Communities and Economy to progress the financial assurance work outlined in Section 3.1. Thank you. Councillor Constable. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. Yes, I welcome this uh, chance to get go bid for this money. Uh, it would be very valuable, uh, I think, in our communities up there for this, if this project would get ahead. Uh, so I move the recommendations, especially noting in recommendation three, that before any formal commitment is made, uh, there will be a report back to the Council. Councillor Coventry. <coughs> yeah, can I just second, Councillor uh, Constable? Uh, we've got the largest arts festival in, in the world on our doorstep. And it'd be a fantastic asset if we could uh, make this work. So, therefore, I think we should be exploring all possible funding streams and supporting the council to, uh, in that uh, endeavour. Okay, happy with that report. Thank you.